Hallelujah. 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 He's a faithful God. Someone said, all that I have needed, your hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, unto me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is no one. No one. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, promised generation. Amen. Stand with me as we turn to Mark, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 28. We recently looked at the scripture, and the Lord has turned it differently this time. And it's a blessing. I wanted to share it with you. Mark, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 28. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Lord, we bless you, we give you glory and honor, we praise you, we exalt your holy and righteous name. We humbly submit ourselves to your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would speak to us, that our lives may be changed, that we may be transformed and conformed to the image of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, recently, uh, we looked at the scripture and we learned that uh, this passage is called the Shema. And um, that means to hear. And uh, in the depth of that word, it means to not just hear, but to obey. And uh, observing Jews all over the world recite the Shema twice a day. What I want you to understand today, well, let's, let's look at the Shema first before I go into that. Um, Jesus responding to uh, being questioned by one who is fancied to be knowledgeable in the law. And he uh, responds by saying that you should Love the Lord with all your heart, which is the center of your inner life, your mind and your thoughts. With all your soul, and that word is nefesh, which means your life. See, it's one thing for us to say that we love God in our inner man, but it's another thing to say we love him enough to lay down our lives, our physical lives. Uh, didn't Jesus say that there is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend? Uh, we all love John 3.16 because it is the revelation that has brought us to this place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So love sacrifices. Amen. 
Jesus said you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your life, and with all your, your, your strength or your might. And that word is miyad, which means with all your very. That's what miyad means in Hebrew is very. And translate it into our understanding, it means you should love the Lord not just in your inner man and in your mind, not just to a place where you're willing to lay down your life, but to love him with the totality of your essence, with your muchness, with all of your increase. So what he's saying is that we should love God to the point that there is nothing that we won't give or give up for him. That's a tall order. That's, that's saying a lot. Amen. And see, what is going on is, uh, is there in Jewish thought, um, they, they're, they're different than us. They embrace uh, the paradoxes in, in the scripture. Uh, those things that we say are contradictions, the textual difficulties that we find in the scriptures. Christians have traditionally uh, ascribed equal weight to the commandments. But in Jewish thinking, you have the heavy laws and the lighter laws. And so uh, there is a, a matter of, uh, according to rabbinic um, approaches, of weighing out which law takes precedent over the other law when you're in a dilemma where you have to decide what to do? Okay, let me, let me give you an example. Let's go to John, the seventh ch chapter and the 19th verse. John's Gospel. Chapter 7, beginning at verse 19. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. In fact, you are trying to kill me. The crowd replied, you're demon possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. Okay, now we've talked about the Sabbath, and we understand that it was created for man, and that's the time that we don't work, that we rest, and that we teach our family and our children, and we discuss, and we have our home Bible studies, and we fellowship over good meals, and, um, and, and we have our personal private time with the Lord. See, when you honor the Sabbath, then you don't hear those responses of, I don't have time to study. I don't have time to get with God. I don't have time because God has set aside a time. Now I know the modern day Christian wants to say, well, I don't serve him every day. I worship him every day. I bless him every day. But God said, I want you to rest. On the day I say rest. I, I don't care about what you do on all those other days. But he has assigned specifically a time for us to be with him. And in, in the course of that, uh, down through the centuries, the, 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 the Jewish tradition has uh, developed certain laws and guidelines con uh, constituting what is rest what is work, what should be done, what should not be done. And so here Jesus is saying to them, I did a miracle on the Sabbath. Now the Orthodox Jews are saying, you're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be performing miracles on the Sabbath, okay? He says, but you work on the Sabbath too. When you obey Moses' law of circumcision, Actually, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. 
For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Okay, so what, 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 what we're dealing with is the, the paradoxes in scripture. We're dealing with uh, the Jewish thought of weighing out the law so that when they come head to head and, and, and one uh, uh, sort of uh, X's out the other, deciding very strategically and methodically because there's a whole process and I'm not going through that of how they have weighed this out and all of that. I'm just trying to give you the gist. Okay. So you have to decide wh which law should I obey? If, 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 if the, the priority of God's law, while I'm talking, turn to Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter is to bring life. OK, we see the law as Christians as the measuring stick to show us how far from perfection we are from God. But our Jewish brothers and sisters see the law as a pathway to him. What to strive for, what to perfect, how can I be better today than I was yesterday? The law leads you into the presence of the Lord. Amen. Okay. And so if, if life is the main purpose of the law and I'm faced with a dilemma, let's say if someone is hiding in my house because someone else is trying to kill them and that person comes to my house and says, have you seen Jojo? Do I lie? which is against the law, Leviticus, the 19th chapter and 11th verse, or do I preserve life, which is the higher order of the law? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, so this, this is a type of issues that, um, uh, the Jewish people weigh out and, and discuss and have written about and, and live by. Now, Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, beginning at verse 16, I want to show you how the law was designed by God to bring life. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, tell your neighbor, if you do this, tell another neighbor, that one didn't want to hear you Tell them somebody else. If you do this, amen, amen. All right. Tap the person in front of you and say, if you do this, you will, what does your Bible say? Live. And increase. Amen. You won't just be walking around with barely nothing. Living from mouth to hand to mouth and paycheck to paycheck and all of that. That's, that's not what God ordained for us. That's not his ultimate desire. He said, yes, the poor you will have with you always. Okay. That's another one of those paradoxes. He tells his people there will be no poor among you. And then he tells them the poor will live among you always. He tells us, every man bear your own burden and then says, but you bear one another's burden. Y'all understand? He says, women should not prophesy unless their head is covered. And then he says, women shouldn't be teaching. Okay. So I'm trying to get you all to understand the, the paradoxes that we find in the word of God. So God, God says to, to Moses, tell the people, for I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. Can you adjust this? I feel like I'm screaming. If you do this, you will live and multiply 
and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. God says, I'm not only going to bless you, but I'm going to bless where your feet stand. I'm going to bless the land. The land is going to yield for you. Amen. When they were in Egypt, they had to labor and they had to toil. And, and in Egypt, the irrigation system was bad. They had to pipe in water and all of that. But God told his people, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bring you forth into a land that flows. It's going to flow with milk and honey. They were an agricultural people. So that meant prosperity. It meant that their herds and their flocks were going to prosper. He told Joshua, tell the people where, wherever they stand and that's theirs. Oh, you ought to stand up right now and then just close your eyes and just in your mind, just walk where you need to be walking to claim what you need to be claiming. Amen. He said, wherever your feet tread, I've given you the land. You need to be taking authority over the land right now. In your mind, you're walking all up your front steps into your living room, your dining room, your family room, your kitchen, your bedroom number one, bedroom number two, bedroom number three, bedroom number four, bedroom number five. Amen. In your mind, you ought to be walking through your office. Praise the Lord. Go and claim that spot for the supervisor. Praise the Lord. It's the Lord bless them, promote them so I can sit in this seat. He said, even a land is going to yield for you. You're not going to have to struggle. That's, that's how it was in the Garden of Eden. That's the way he designed it for man. Uh, Adam didn't have to labor the trees, bear off more fruit. He didn't have to water the grass. God watered the grass. A mist came up. And watered all of the vegetation. It's because of disobedience that we labor and that we struggle. Amen. Jer he told Jeremiah, let the people know it's your sins that have kept you in poverty. How many of you know that you, you in debt now because of some of your stuff? Being somewhere you wasn't supposed to be, spending money you shouldn't have been spending. Taking care of Jojo Pookie and Ray Ray. Amen. Giving Pan Suki's babysitter, praise God. No, you weren't even supposed to be messing with Suki. Suki went in your wallet, took all your money. Spending money on all of that, the substances and all of that stuff. How much is a drink now? Oh, okay. We got specialists in the house. <laughs> they say, depend on what you're drinking. How much are cigarettes now? I can't believe people still smoke. $6 a pack? $8 a pack? And $11 in New York City. My goodness, if we just stop smoking and drinking, if we just stop buying porn, if we. But we're talking about the land blessing you. Now, look at verse 17. We're talking about the, uh, God speaking that if you keep my law, my law will bring you life. Not only will it bring you life, but it will bring you abundance. It will bring you prosperity. Verse 17 says, but if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. We, we have to take inventory every day. Lord, what is it in my life that's causing me to have to struggle? It's not the devil. It's me. I am my greatest enemy. My ungodly desires that draw me into sin. Amen. Lust is not sin. Sin is a result of lust. It's your lust that takes you into sin. 
Because we sit there and we look at it and we think about it. That's why single folks can't be going to sleep listening to Luther Vandross. <laughs> They're talking about I'm going to live holy. <laughs> Luther getting all up in your spirit. You can't eat, you can't sleep or nothing else. Trying to find Luther. We have to guard our ear gates and our eye gates. What comes in because it gets processed. And we don't understand why we're struggling and battling in the spirit. Why we're not over it yet. Why we can't walk upright before the Lord and live holy in his presence. But what are you feeding? Not your body, your spirit. Whatever they're listening to now, I don't know. I'm old school. They still listening to Luther? Amen. Uh, 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 we, we've got to find out a way to uh, be able to get feedback from our online visitors so that they can call in or text us or something and give us some answers. He says, I warn you that you will be destroyed. You will not live a long, good life. In the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death. Between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. So you're not just, just paving the way for you. It's not just about you, but your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren are, de this, are depending on the decisions that you make today. Verse 20 says, you can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swear to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what I'm talking to you today. I'm talking to you, you, you today about choosing love. Choosing love. God's word is given to us to bring us life. And he says, if you honor me by obeying me, you will live well and prosper. That doesn't mean that nothing's going to go wrong in your life. When we make a commitment to the Lord, all hell breaks loose in our life. Because Satan doesn't want to let you go. He invested a lot in you. Amen. You didn't get to be as good a liar as you are on your own. Amen. You, you think you were born a thief? You may have had been genetically predisposed to thieving. But he made sure you got the, a thief's education. Didn't, didn't a, a good thief come and walk alongside you and tell you how to do it? Didn't a good liar teach you all the tricks? Amen, amen, amen. You didn't learn how to pull fellas by yourself. There was a woman somewhere... So, so the power, I, I showed you that, um, to, 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 to going back to John, the seventh chapter, we see that, that, that paradox of, uh, do, do I commit circumcision if it's on the Sabbath? So what takes precedent? And precedence is, is given to the circumcision. 
because that's the symbol of the covenant that God has with his people. Now, note that this came out of an effort to live by God's law in every situation, not to arbitrarily choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. The, the point of it all is, Lord, how can I please you? What is the higher good? Choose love. That's the higher good. That's the higher good. When you're faced with a dilemma, when you're, when you're struggling in a situation, Jesus says, choose love. Okay? And it's out of this paradox that this young man comes to Jesus. Because remember, we're no longer thinking as Westerners. We're no longer taking the word of God and translating it into American situations. But we have to see the scriptures through the eyes of Jesus, a practicing, observing Jewish man and all of the people that are around him who are observant Jews and what these things mean to them. If I, if I write you a letter and I pour my heart out in that letter or I express some issues or concerns in that letter, it's not about what it means to you. It's about what it means to me. What is my point of reference? How do I interpret the situation, the conversation, the gestures? You understand? And so we've got to look at the scriptures with fresh eyes. We've got to look at the scriptures with the eyes of our Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, there are going to be people who are going to fall off because they don't want to dig deeper. See, what this means is that all of us who think we know the word and we can quote the scripture and finish it before when you started and all of that, you're going to have to scrap all of that and start all over again. So here he comes to Jesus. Both of them, as is their custom, have been studying the scriptures since they were knee high to a grasshopper, whatever that means. Since they were toddlers, their father has been teaching them the word of God, the scriptures. And they've sat with the elders and they've heard it and the debating and, 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 and all of this, the discussions. And so he is speaking to Jesus out of that context. Well, I know that there are 613 points of the law. What is the greatest? What is the most important, Jesus? Now you're answering all everybody else's questions and I see that, that you get, you got it down. Tell me what I need to do to please God. Jesus said, choose love. I believe that if I don't preach on anything else the entire year of 2013, but love that every week we will have a fresh revelation. Because that is the foundation and that is the key. That is what all of this is all about. And, and, and we've got to get to the place that we open our hearts and we receive that truth. And we walk in it. Jesus says, choose love. Now the Talmud, which is the rabbinic writing that is held second to the Torah, it, it says, the whole worth of a kind deed lies in the love that inspires it. So I, I can do all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, I can build orphanage in Africa. We can go over there. We can dig wells. And, and then we can go to West Virginia, hint, hint, and help folks that may be in need there. Amen. Or we, we, we can uh, fill this church up with everybody in Brentwood, Maryland. But guess what? If it's not rooted in love, we are talking loud and saying nothing. 
The whole worth of a kind deed lies in the love that inspires it. Doing what Jesus commanded is not to earn salvation, but it's about discipleship. Salvation is a free gift, but discipleship is a lifelong journey. It's a journey of dedicating ourselves to becoming more like Christ. We're saved. Now we've got to look at God's word and let it lead us to him. Let it perfect us. So how can we say, I don't have time to study? When that's, 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 that's who we are. That's what we are. Folks say, I don't like to drink water. You're 75% water. You are water. So how can God's word not be our priority? There's a story about some refugees that were running from the Nazis and when they got back into their home place, everything was destroyed and, and, and they w- went down into the, the basement of their temple and they found some uh, 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 Torah writings that were still able to be read. And, and even though the soldiers were marching and looking for them and, and on their heels, they stopped and they read scripture and there was another guy that was on the run and he stopped and asked them what are y'all doing don't you uh, we're on the run why are you reading they told him be quiet how can we not study ask your neighbor how can we not study ask somebody else i want to make them good and mad ask somebody else how can we not study Somebody else, somebody else, how can we not study? Don't be shamed. Say it out loud so that you can hear it. How can we not study? Now, Jesus deals with the paradoxes. He, in, in Luke, the sixth chapter, the, the, the 46th verse, he says, you know, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? We know that we do that so often. You know, um, we hear people calling on the name of the Lord and they're not doing a thing that the Lord says. They just, just hang out at the church for the social aspect. Let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I know I'm jumping around, but I hope that, you know, through the Holy Spirit, it'll all tie in and work in together. You all take in your notes and you can follow through and, 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 and read this and put it together and piece it together the way that you comprehend. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses one and two. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, We urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already and we encourage you to do so, so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and telling them, you should still be studying. You may know a couple of scriptures, but guess what? It's not enough. You've got to go deeper. You've got to pursue. Why? Because God's law is going to lead you into life. It's going to lead you into health. It's going to lead you into prosperity. Many times I say to you all that there's some things that come into our lives that don't have to be in our lives. And these are the things that we can cast down. But if we're not living according to God's word and according to his law, if we don't know that we're not living according to his law because we're not studying diligently. See, study is a form of worship. People tell you a minute, oh, I'm a worshiper. Do you study? No, then you're not worshiping. The Talmud says, he who studies the scriptures but does no works of love lives without God. (laughs) 
So we don't want to go off on the other direction either. I'm deep. I'm in the word. I don't have time. Because see, let's, let's go to um, Luke the 10th chapter. Remember now, this young man has come to Jesus and he's asking him how to prioritize obedience. How, 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 how do I weigh the law? Jesus weighed out the law. He talked to them about uh, uh, doing, do you do good or do evil on the Sabbath? Do you save life or destroy it? Jewish doctors and nurses work on the Sabbath. Why? Because of the higher law of preserving life. He questioned the Pharisees. When you, if you have a sheep that falls in the well on the Sabbath, are you going to dig them out? Yes. Why? The higher law of preserving life. Are you going to untie your animal and lead them to get water on the Sabbath? Yes. Why? Because of the law that says to mitigate the suffering of others. And of animals. When you go into the word of God and De- Deuteronomy and Leviticus, you see God's concern for the animals. That even they rest. And they be treated well. Tell somebody, I really got to start reading my Bible. In Luke, the 13th chapter, you all hear me. I love this scripture to minister from the scripture. The woman who was bent over for um, 18 years. Jesus heals her on the Sabbath. He relieves the suffering of the woman who is bent over. So the idea of weighing the laws of the Torah was likely the rationale. For this young man's question to Jesus. He wasn't just being obstinate. See, in Jewish tradition, it's okay to question the teacher. They have open discussions. Bible study isn't just folk sitting there looking at the preacher and the preacher, you know, teaching for an hour and then sitting down exhausted because no one else had an opinion. Amen? It's okay to express what you hear and, 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 and what you think and what you, and ask your questions. God loves questions. Who are these, Lord? He never smacked anybody down for asking a question. Search the scripture. Now, there's some things that God is not going to answer. There's some revelation we are not going to get. When we go into the book of Revelation, we go into the book of Daniel. There were some things that both writers were told, no, save that. That is not going to be given. God is not going to reveal that. That's why we have the argument in the body of Christ today. Uh, uh, Once saved, always saved. Yes, no, I don't know. Well, the scripture says this. Well, over here, the scripture says that. We're always going to have those paradoxes. But Jesus says, when you get to a place where you have to make a decision about how to please God and how to become what God wants you to become and how to live the life that God wants you to live. He wished that none should perish. God did not create hell for man, but since man wants to go. There's there's a life that God wants for us. But if we don't obey him, we can't go into it. We can't step into it. So Jesus says, when you're faced with a dilemma, choose love. Choose love. Prime example, Luke, the 10th chapter. Are you all there already? You've been there for a while, haven't you? You know how I am. I'm trying to get better. I'm going to try to cut my sermons down to 45 minutes. All right, Pastor Tony. I heard that. That was laughter for those of you who can't hear. Okay. 
Luke the 10th chapter beginning at verse 25. We learned this when we were youngins. The parable of the Good Samaritan. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. See, they were always testing Jesus. Some of them honestly wanting answers. Some of them thinking they knew more than him and that they were going to put him in an awkward position. Some of them, as in this case, looking for a way out. Looking for that loophole in the law. Teacher or rabbi, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? See there? Didn't that just prove my point? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with oh, the, the what? Shema. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this. And you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Loophole. Does this mean I have to love everybody? Jesus, tell me that my neighbor is the person that I like and that likes me. The person that I have things in common with the person that I'm impressed with, the person that can do me a favor, I can scratch their back and they can scratch mine. Jesus, tell me that my neighbor is not the person who gives me a hard time or who doesn't think that I'm dark and lovely and fabulous. Tell me that I don't have to, to love the person who puts their trash can in front of my house. who doesn't meet their deadlines at work and I have to take up the slack. Takes my parking space, even though it's a city free parking space, it's in front of my house where I don't own land. Tell me I don't have to love them. Jesus said, look, I got something for you. Look at here. A Jewish man, okay, keep that in mind. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant or a Levite walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Now, I can't get in my car because you're going to mess up my upholstery. And took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. 
look at this now. You, we, we understand from previous studies that at this time, the Jews and the Samaritans, they had ought against each other. And it came from that whole dividing of the nations and the Samaritans being invaded and carried away and, and being infiltrated by the enemy, which was a common military strategy um, of, of the um, Assyrians, that they would take folks out of the city and then bring folks from other areas into the city. And so even though the Jews and the Samaritans were the same because the Samaritans had been carried away, and because their blood had been intermingled, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't have any dealings with each other. There was hostility between them because the, the Jews didn't consider the Samaritans any longer to be a part of them. So you've got a Jewish man. Say he's just riding along and he gets caught.